My name is Thomas Strepernay. I'm the head of business development for Canada and Latin America. And I'm here today with Kareem Hamazni, a special guest from RBCX. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks for having me. My name is Kareem Hamazni. I uh, head of decentralized strategy at RBCX, which is a tech and innovation banking arm of RBC, which is the Royal Bank of Canada. We're uh, an R&D team predominantly focused on the digital asset ecosystem and the growth within. I kind of do jack of all trades when it comes to digital assets, evaluating risk, business opportunities, technology, and so on. To set the stage, could you tell us a little bit more about RBCX and why it was founded? Yeah, so RBCX is a tech and innovation banking arm of RBC. And within that, we have a banking practice that's focused more towards the tech and innovation ecosystem in Canada. But we also have our ventures group that's housed within RBCX. And so our wholly acquired companies, plus also internally started companies and fintechs to, uh, operate out of there. What are some of the primary use cases you're seeing gaining traction with respect to blockchain and, and stablecoins in the industry today? A lot of people saw blockchain as a solution looking for a problem. But now with the advent of stablecoins, we're actually seeing some real value emerge in these ecosystems where people are using it to transfer cross-border payments in a much faster and more efficient way, leveraging the blockchain technologies for speed and efficiency. And with that, what we're seeing is not only is the payment leg speeding up on chain, but that actually makes technologies like real world assets far more viable than before. Because if you have the payment leg on chain alongside the asset on chain, then you can start to do things like atomic swaps, which is immediate settlement and transfer of tokenized and digitized securities and assets and so on, which can make back office operations far more efficient than they are today. I guess if we were to take a step further and look into seeing how that is going to move from a 24-7 model uh, and settlement needs to happen securely and quickly, obviously around the clock, how do you see banks tackling cross-border transactions uh, in the way and in all the different quarters globally? Actually, a lot of innovation happening both on-chain and off-chain. In Canada, we're implementing real-time payment rails with our domestic payment system, which is going to make it, things a lot faster and more efficient. But cross-border, you hit a few snags in that you have to now cooperate with different systems around the world. And what stablecoins have the potential of doing, as long as they the risks can be mitigated and they can fall within a regulated framework, is that they can make cross-border country-to-country payments far more efficient, which can open up new markets to investors around the world. And that's tremendously exciting because today payments often hit snags when they have to go through correspondent banks and they have to go through some inefficient processes that don't necessarily run it 24-7. But with stablecoins, since blockchains are always on, they're always operational. And you can code in certain rules in the payments and transfers to ensure that they follow a certain path and that it minimizes the, the, the opportunity of something to go wrong, then that has the potential to make payments far more efficient and far more reliable than they've been before. If we take that point a step further and talk a little bit about the expansion of asset utility beyond trading, beyond the immediate benefits for trading and settlement, how do you see the tokenization of assets facilitated by financial institutions unlocking new forms of utility or enabling new financial products? Yeah, I feel like um, there's some really interesting use cases with tokenized assets that can really make them more attractive to investors. So for example, treasuries today, the, the treasury itself pays out twice a year. And when there's a token, when there's a treasury or money market product in the traditional finance world, typically that has a monthly payment. So if you look at an ETF of a money market fund, and if you actually look at the price of that money market fund, it should trade close to a dollar, but you do notice that it kind of, it, it's kind of jagged when it comes to the price leading up to when the, the yield is paid out. And that's due to the fact that it's paid out monthly. And the reason why there's a monthly payment cadence is because it's just too costly and onerous to do that more frequently. In the traditional system, you do have to go through the traditional rails, which can be costly, a little slow, and then reconciling everything to make sure nothing goes wrong. Uh, historically has been a bit of a challenge. What tokenizing something like a money market fund can do is you can actually make the payment cadence far more frequent, perhaps even by the block. And that way, as a holder, you can hold it for a short term and you're still generating yield. And that would be far more attractive to holders so that they don't have to necessarily wait for that month to expire before they, they want to get out of a, a money market fund position. They can hold it for that short term, realize the yield which makes it far more, uh, far, there's a far better utility to the investor. 
what would in your view then be regarding challenges and opportunities so for for example so what would be some of the things that you see as uh, in the financial sector as it's adopting more digital assets and more more tokenization overall historically digital assets have earned a reputation of being a hotbed for things like financial crime money laundering and risk and to be to be clear a lot of that risk is realized we we see that happening in crypto and blockchain ecosystems on a daily basis and to play in that ecosystem we need to manage the risk effectively with the right AML controls, with the right uh, compliance controls in order to do this in a safe and sound way. And we have to remind ourselves that regulation is out there to really protect investors. And as long as we keep that front of mind and we design these systems so that there's no opportunity for fraud or any mismanagement, then we can continue to protect investors, but then give them the added benefit and the utility of this ecosystem. And so we really do need to figure out how to manage the risk of the overall ecosystem more effectively and have that bleed into some of the new products and services that are being built on chain that are more compliant, that do play more by the rules, and that have consumer protection in front of mind. Amazing. I like to leave in the discussion rather to learn a little bit more about your thoughts on interoperability in terms of what are your views on how critical the interoperability is between blockchains on traditional financial infrastructure. So it could be the TNX or it could be uh, DTCC or SWIFT to that matter. Regulatory frameworks it, it, for the widespread success of on-chain transactions overall. Yeah, I think interoperability is tremendously important. I've often said when it comes to the world of blockchain and digital assets, there are four major pain points holding back the ecosystem from really flourishing. The first is usability. For the average person, it's too hard to use blockchain. The second is scalability. Uh, networks just were incapable of handling a critical mass of users for a while. The third is interoperability because there's just too much siloing going on. And the last is volatility and stability of the native assets, which fluctuated too much in price or ineffective as a currency. But we're, what we're seeing, tremendous advancements solving all four of those pain points. Usability is better than it's ever been. Scalability is much more performant on better performing L1s plus the L2 ecosystem. And stability is being solved with um, stable coins, which removes some of the volatility in payments. Interop still has a lot of room to grow and advance in, but what that will solve is it'll re remove fragmentation in the ecosystem. There's no one chain fits all solution right now for the world of traditional financial products. And most of the capital and liquidity is currently in the Ethereum ecosystem. And, the, and that's a great network and a great ecosystem. However, for a regulated financial institution, there's concerns around things like privacy and compliance and so on, and that's not necessarily baked into those chains. And so what we're seeing is a trend and people are building layer twos that are more privacy and compliance focused. But when you build a layer two on top of a different network, you're fragmenting all that activity away from that core network. And that's where interoperability comes in because it can be a bridge that can bring liquidity into that network. And liquidity is really the most important thing when it comes to finance, because if you're going to start tokenizing assets, you need a market to sell into. And by removing friction from getting that liquidity that exists on different networks and different chains will help the success of your financial products and services by bridging that liquidity into the ecosystem. So I think interoperability is tremendously important, and it's going to be a major unlock for this ecosystem. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. From your vantage point, where you see things happening, from RBCX's uh, standpoint, it's really important for us to 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 make sure that we understand where where you see it, and as well as uh, how we can work work together going forward. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg.